And on the Kilcoin Conversation, we have racing royalty, a man who needs no introduction, Rusty Wallace with us. And Rusty, what an exciting week with NASCAR back in St. Louis. And, and I know we talked a year ago, but for a guy who's from this area, what does it mean to have a NASCAR stop in, in our backyard? Well, it's it's really important for St. Louis to get this. I mean, I'm so excited for the track to have a, be hosting a NASCAR Cup event. It's unreal. We did it last year. It was a huge success. Now it's going to happen again during NASCAR's 75th anniversary, which is really big. Um, almost all the tracks we've been going to have been sold out this year because of the 75th. But uh, for me, it's going to be special because I get to drive my favorite car midnight around the track to pace the start of the field. So uh, a lot of people will see the number two black and yellow Miller Genio draft car that was so famous back in the day. I love this. You'll be doing the pace car. I've always wanted, do drivers have a favorite look over the year, like a car and just the wrap on it and all the sponsors, logos? Is there, obviously, that one, that's pretty legendary for you. Do drivers have favorite cars, look-wise? Oh, oh, absolutely. There are so many drivers that, that had cars that just performed so good that they end up winning a lot of races with that they, you know, uh, they really love and talk about a lot. And in fact, back when I was driving, we used to name all our cars. And so this particular car was called Midnight that I'm bringing. It's one of my favorite cars. There's one of close to 20 races with that car. And uh, we had different names. And, and some guys used to use, just used to number their cars, but I thought that was kind of boring. But we had our cars all named up. We had one car named Buckwheat. We had one car named Vanessa. We had one car named Midnight. Another one named Midnight Rider. We went on and on with different names. Who, who named them? Was it you? I mean, I'm trying to think. Who came up with Buckwheat? Who came up with Vanessa? Did the family weigh in? No, it wasn't a family at all. It was all the crew guys. Okay. It would be all the crew guys that were team members on the car, and every now and then the car owner, which was Raymond Beetle, uh, back then when we were doing that, he used to do that. And then Team Penske, uh, when we first started Team Penske, that's when we were naming our cars, and that's how Midnight got named. But Midnight actually was a brand-new car that we took to Richmond, Virginia. We were leading the race throughout the day, and all of a sudden it started raining. It was a night race. And it started raining, so we had a big delay. So about a bottom line, when he went back to green, I ended up winning the race. And as I crossed the line, uh, it was, uh, the clock struck midnight. Wow. When I pulled into victory lane, everybody said, let's name it midnight. I said, why? Because you crossed the line, checker flag waved. I looked down at our digital watch, and it said midnight. <laughs> so that's how it got its name. I wonder how many people were drinking Miller Genuine Draft and thinking about Rusty Wallace. It's amazing how the brand sticks to the driver. You know, I just... I mean, I, I just I still picture. I don't know if people are still drinking MGD, but if they are, I bet you they're sort of thinking of Rusty Wallace. Like that last, that image, that branding lasts forever. Well, it sure does seem like it. People always do tie me to that, and it's 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 pretty cool, you know, that that happens. And it's going to be even cooler to see that car running around St. Louis, you know, and everybody knowing that was one of my favorite cars. Did you save all your cars? I mean, do you have a, a warehouse full of them from your racing days? No, not really. I do have three uh, completely ra- race-ready t- cars with real engines and everything in it that were some of my favorite cars. I've got the car that I finished my career with in 2005 in Homestead, Florida. It's actually on display at the NASCAR Hall of Fame right now. And then uh, the car that I uh, won uh, uh, the big race at Bristol, Tennessee. That was one of my favorite cars at Bristol. My 55th victory uh, I-, I completed with that car. So uh, that was a really cool car. I'm sorry, a 50th win. 50th win car, that's what it was. And yeah. I got that car. And then we got Midnight. That's on the way to St. Louis next week. So you had 55 wins. You had 349 top 10s. I wonder how many of the top 10s, instead of saying, hey, that's great, I had a top 10, how many of those you would say, oh, I could have won that race. I should have won that race. Or does every driver say that? Oh, man, every driver says that. But I could have said that so many times about the Brickyard 400 in Indianapolis. I finished second in that race three times, one of the biggest races in all of NASCAR back then, and uh, have three second-place finishes only to get passed with nine laps to go in in almost all three of them. Under ten laps to go, I got passed. Unbelievable. But uh, really neat. And then, you know, Bristol. Uh, Bristol, Tennessee, one of my favorite tracks where I had great success there. Uh, I remember I lost two races on the very last corner. Uh, that was a hard one to take. And if that would have been, if that would have happened good, I would have had, oh my God, 11 wins. Wow. But, um, oh well. <laughs> well, oh well it, it all, it all worked. You know what, Rusty? It all worked out 
Pretty well. What do you think of the modern uh, state of NASCAR? Uh, you mentioned the sellouts, and it seems like, honestly, the more people are you know, having rivalries, whether it's Chastain. I did an interview with Alex Bowman. He said, oh, people like to boo me. And I said, why do you think it is? He said, I tend to wreck really popular drivers. And he said, then they never <laughs> forgive you for that. I, the rivalries are good. What do you think of the current NASCAR season? I think current NASCAR season has been real good so far. I mean, it's been very, very popular. I mean, uh, we had a sellout crowd last week. Uh, we're going to sell our crowd this week as we're doing this interview. Uh, uh, there's a big race coming up in Charlotte this week, and uh, that's going to be a big one. But everything, the crowds have been huge, and I, I really attribute a lot of that to NASCAR's 75th anniversary this year. They're pretty well excited. We've got the fan base really jacked up. But it's, it's, it's going to be a banner year, that's for sure. And do the rivalries help? I mean, do drivers? I feel like it's genuine. Like they get mad at each other, or they go to punch them. Like I don't. It's not like they're staging it. They really are pissed off, right? No, they're really upset. Yeah, there's there, it, there's a lot on the line, a lot of money on the line, a lot of guys that uh, are having a good year and a tough year, and their sponsors are on the rear end to perform better, and so are the car owners. So they all got pressure on them, and when they when they're get just about to win a race or something good's going to happen. And they get in the wreck, and they're out. And, uh, my God, they're, they're just completely so upset they can't see straight. So probably more pressure right now than when I was driving. I mean, everybody had pretty good rides, and they had good teams. But now they're popping all over the doggone place with a lot of pressure on them. Is it an unwritten rule? Let's say it's the final lap, and you're running second. But you are right on the rear of the leader. What what are you allowed? Is it, you know, in terms of pu- pushing, bumping, whatnot, what, is it well, unwritten? It is really unwritten, but uh, it's r- pretty clear that NASCAR almost lets anything happen the last lap. And if you get to it, and there's a thing called a bump and run where you can, you know, a lot of guys do it. You get down to the last corner. If you can catch the leader with that front bumper and give him a little tap and night, maybe knock him up the track out of shape and you drive underneath him and go for the victory, it's pretty well been, been accepted. Now, with that said, the driver that gets that done to him, he, he, he'll he be laying for that guy next week. <laughs> so if you do it, you better be ready to get it back. Did you ever bump and run somebody and they were really, really mad at you? Oh, yeah, Jeff Gordon of Richmond, Virginia. Him and I, he got into me at Bristol, Tennessee, knocked me up a track, last corner. I caught him back at Richmond, Virginia a couple weeks later and, and paid to return favor, knocked him up the track. But <laughs> when I hit him, but this time when I hit Jeff Gordon, he lost it and hit the wall pretty hard. <laughs> Well, I, so, I, uh, we laugh about it now. We're pretty good friends now, but back then, with his man, we were super competitive. And I would think you know if you're in the lead that it's you have to almost brace for it, right? Are you really ready for it? No, you're ready for it. You know it's it's it's, it's going to happen, and if it does happen, you, hopefully you can back steer and drive your way out of it. You know, but um, if it's if they get you by surprise, then sometimes you get startled and you really can't catch the car again. But there's been many times I said, okay, I'm going to get it right here. And, boy, when they do, I made sure I was driving nice and straight and and had the brake and gas pedal working pretty good, you know. You'll be doing radio. You've done TV over the years. What do you like about being in the broadcast booth? And, and are you critical? Are you allowed to be? Do they encourage that? Tell me about your approach. No, I'm just real truthful about what I do, you know. Then I use some common sense. You know, if I'm unsure about what happened, I'm not going to bust the guy that, that did it, you know. So, uh, that's not my job. My, my job is not to be real critical. And that's one thing that when I was with ESPN that they wanted to hear, television wanted drama. But in radio, man, they just want to hear what's going on on the track at that time. And I really love that. I, I love working with the guys from Motor Racing Network. I've been with them for nine years now, and we're really good friends. And I think we put out really good broadcasts. Uh, but that's what we're doing. We're not getting ourselves involved in controversy. We're just calling what we see out the window going on right now. What's your interaction like with current drivers? They obviously know who you are. They recognize you. You're around the track doing broadcasting. Do you talk much to these guys, the current drivers? I do. I do, but not near as much as they did when I was driving. But And I, I, I tend to talk to the, more of the veterans than I do the new guys. Uh, and they're, they're always asking me questions, and I'm asking them questions. But, uh, it, yeah, I was, I'm very, very involved in NASCAR still. You know, it's, I couldn't hardly imagine myself not being involved in the sport. And when television went away and, it was, and, and I was asked to do radio, I did that. And I really enjoyed doing that because it keeps me involved in the sport. It, it, you know, I had a choice either to stay in the sport or get out of the sport. When I quit driving, I, I elected I wanted to stay in the sport and still be involved in it. So the radio lets me do that. 
winding it down with Rusty Wallace, our guest on the Kilcoin Conversation, for St. Louis to be a long-term home for NASCAR. What do they need to do? Because it's going to be tough to, you know, the first year was so much fun. The fans were so into it. How do you maintain that level? And NASCAR obviously is keeping an eye on it because you want this you want this to be a forever event for fans around here. Well, one of the biggest things, uh, the, the, the owner of the racetrack is just doing fantastic. Francis is just doing what he needs to be doing. What we've got to have is we've got to have the, the fans in St. Louis signing up uh, to the fact that there's a NASCAR Cup track there, and they love it, and they want to support it. And, and they just need to support the track. And let's just hope that the fans um, will stay as strongly involved as they did last year, and I know they're, it's going to be really big this year. But you just everybody's got to sign up for the fact they got a cup race there, and let's let's, let's make it the best we possibly can. There's many areas that uh, the, the cities have lost interest in NASCAR for whatever reason, uh, maybe because the cities are just too big. One that comes to my mind is, you know, some of the big races originally out in California. It, it didn't work for a while, then it started coming back. Um, sometimes there's just so much to do in these big big cities that people forget there's a big race going on, but. Let's just keep the, the, the fan base and uh, everybody in St. Louis engaged in the track. That's one of the biggest things you got to do. Who will be in charge of corralling Kenny for the weekend? Who will keep your brother under wraps? He'll probably be losing his mind by the time the race hits on Sunday. He's well, he's always fired up. Well, he's pretty doggone excited, that's for sure. And so I'm going to keep him, keep him fired up. He's excited that I'm going to come. They're really going to honor me. Uh, at the track this week, a lot of cool things going on because I've, it's the 75th anniversary and I'm from that area. And and uh, so I'm going to fly up there. I'll be get there on Saturday and uh, do midnight, drive it around the racetrack on Sunday, and uh, we'll, have, we'll have a great week. Rusty, thanks for your time. We we'll look forward to seeing you at the track. Okay, thank you.